But uh, politics of a more conventional nature is continuing because the voters of Hartlepool have been selecting a replacement for Peter Mandelson. The Labour MP, of course, resigned his seat to take a job as European Commissioner for Trade. He left a hefty Labour majority of more than 14,000, but the Liberal Democrats have been doing well in recent by-elections. Well, the journalist Michael Crick, who makes by-elections his own personal speciality, is in Hartlepool. Uh, let's speak to him now. Uh, first of all, Michael, I have to um, ask you what the reaction has been there to this news from the Prime Minister. Well, I have to say that people, the news about Tony Blair has been filtering through, but you know, if, on by-election night, people are only concerned about one thing, and that's what's going on here and the result here. And people haven't really had time to digest it properly. And it is a very complicated situation with Blair and the implications and what it all means and so on. Uh, people just haven't had time to think about it. And so, uh, really, there and, and indeed they won't do so until we get the result here, which I, I think is going to be round about midnight. That's the, the prediction uh, of when the count will, will come to be declared. How's it looking? Uh, we're hearing it's going to be a close result. Well, yes, I, I, both Labour and the Lib Dem say it is going to be very close indeed. A uh, Conservative MP uh, here thinks that actually uh, that Labour's won it. And if you were to put a gun to my head, I would say yes, probably Labour. But without any great confidence, I went round the polling stations today, spent much of the day going round the polling stations, talking to voters coming out. And, uh, the, and asking them how they voted. And the division of opinion was almost equal between uh, Lib Dems and Labour in, in terms of the contest between those two parties. And a lot of people just refused to say which way they voted, which was a lot more than, than usual, I find, in by-elections, uh, and particularly in the Labour wards. And I couldn't work out whether that was simply because the, they, these were people who were switching from Labour to perhaps Lib Dems and were, were slightly ashamed of doing so, or maybe these were people who were sticking with Labour and were ashamed of doing that. So it is a very difficult election to call and nobody really here tonight is, is predicting the outcome at this stage certainly with very much confidence. There's also a sort of second contest going on here between the Conservatives and UKIP over who comes third and fourth. I mean, even for the th Conservatives to come third is going to be bad news for them because, of course, they were second at the general election and uh, it, they look like slipping down to third, uh, as indeed they have done in the last three by-elections in Brent and, and Birmingham and, and Leicester. Uh, and that's appalling news, really, uh, so near to a general election. And there was speculation that the Conservatives might even be uh, overtaken by UKIP. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. It, it is still possible, I suppose, but it, I, I think probably the Conservatives will come ahead of UKIP, but a well, well, well behind either Labour or the Lib Dems. Of course, in other recent by-elections, Leicester South, for example, um, the Iraq war was a huge factor, a, a big Asian vote there. Uh, in a sense, the Liberal Democrats haven't been quite able to make the same headway on that issue there in Hartlepool, have they? Absolutely. I mean, in, in all those three by-elections, Brent, Hodge Hill and uh, in Leicester South, there was a, a very large uh, Muslim community in each of those constituencies, whereas the Muslim population in Hartlepool is, is tiny. I mean, quite a lot of people did mention the war today as a reason uh, for not voting Labour, but n not in anything like the numbers that they did in, in those three by-elections when I was there. Um, and, and, and in a way, I suppose, if the Lib Dems do win tonight, that makes their ch achievement uh, all the more uh, startling, really, that they will have... Uh, won this seat if they do and I, I mean nobody really knows but if they were to win the seat or, and, and certainly they're going to come close it makes the achievement all the greater in a way that they did so without there being a huge Muslim uh, vote uh, who disaffected uh, from from Labour. Okay Michael Crick for now thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, of course we'll bring you that result just we mustn't forget of course that the Prime Minister is facing a more traditional political test this evening the by-election in Hartlepool Mr Blair's close political friend Peter Mandelson left a healthy majority there but of course by-elections have turned up some shocks in the recent past Hartlepool is the sixth by-election so far in this parliament all of them in Labour seats well Nick Hyam has been looking at the results so far by-elections are never a good guide to the likely result at a general election, but they can tell you when a party is popular or unpopular, and sometimes why. So let's look at the five by-elections so far since June 2001. The first of the current Parliament was held in Ipswich in November 2001. Labour's Chris Mole held the seat comfortably, but with a majority that dropped from around 8,000 to just over 4,000. But then the turnout was much lower because it was only six months after the general election.
Labour also held Ogmore in South Wales in February 2002. Hugh Iranka Davis was elected, but again with a majority that fell from almost 15,000 to under 10,000. Then came the invasion of Iraq and the controversy over the war, and Labour lost their first seat at a by-election since 1988. That was in Brent East in September last year, for London Mayor Ken Livingstone's old constituency. The Liberal Democrat Sarah Tether turned a Labour majority of more than 13,000 into a Lib Dem majority of just over 1,000. The same thing happened in July this year in Leicester South. The Liberal Democrats' Pamjit Singh Gill became the party's first Asian MP, turning a Labour majority of more than 13,000 into a Lib Dem majority of 1,600. And on the same night, the Lib Dems very nearly snatched Birmingham Hodge Hill as well. Labour's Liam Byrne just hung on after the majority dropped from nearly 12,000 to just 460. What's more, respect. George Galloway's party that's vehemently opposed to the war in Iraq polled 6% in Hodge Hill and 13% in Leicester South. What all these last three constituencies have in common is a significant Asian and indeed Muslim population. British Asians used to be solid Labour voters, but not anymore. It seems Iraq's persuaded many of them to switch allegiance. And the Liberal Democrats, the largest party opposed to the invasion of Iraq, are the biggest beneficiaries. In Leicester South, 26% of the voters, according to the 1991 census, are of Asian origin. And in Birmingham Hodge Hill, that figure is almost 12%. Now, Hartlepool has no Asian community to speak of. It's 99% white. And it's a safe old Labour seat. The outcome of the by-election will be closely watched to see if anti-war sentiment in the town is strong enough to unsettle or even unseat Labour even without that Asian vote. And there's another question. The Conservatives were pushed from second into third place in Brent East, Leicester South and Hodge Hill. In Hartlepool, the Tories face a challenge not only from the Lib Dems but from the UK Independence Party. On the back of UKIP's successes in the European elections, it's possible the Conservatives could find themselves not just in third place but in fourth place tonight. That was Nick Hyam there with... Some details of some of the by-elections that we've known and loved over the past Parliament. Now, we're hearing from Hartlepool that the turnout there is going to be round about 40%, uh, not particularly high, not too unusual for a by-election. Um, Peter Hayne, what are you hearing? Are you going to hold on to this seat? Well, we'll have to wait for the result, but we fought a very good campaign. And the Liberals, Democrats, are uh, renowned street fighters in by-elections. They have a very effective by-election technique. We beat them in Hodge Hill. We didn't beat them in Leicester South. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But we've run an excellent campaign. We've been very confident about that campaign. Simon Hughes, uh, Peter's not giving anything away about what he's hearing. What about you? Have you got any well, details of how it's looking for we you? We all started uh, big Labour majority. Tories in second place, 14,000 behind. We were in third place, 17,000 behind. Um, I can comfortably predict that we will have overtaken the Tories. I agree with um, that. I comfortably predict the race will be between Labour and us. And the latest information I was there today is that it could be quite close. If we were to win, it would be a phenomenal victory. And as Peter rightly said, to be fair, we've had four recent, this is the fourth recent sort of by-election like this. We've won two. We didn't quite win the third. But the interesting thing was that the Tories got relegated from second to third place in every one of them. David, you haven't done very well in the last few by-elections. Are you going to do any better in this one? Well, the last few by-elections have been very frustrating for us. Yeah, there's no disguising it. And it has been frustrating, especially when you're getting on the doorstep. This strong mood against the Prime Minister and against the Labour government, but we have to convert into support for ourselves. Well, we'll have to see. I'm not going to start speculating, but we have to recognise. I mean, we began with only four councillors in Hartlepool. This was not a place where we had a strong political base, sadly, on which we well, could build. Well, you were in second place. But not only in yeah, second we... place, uh, if I may intervene, Carol, 
the Tories actually won the seat a few they decades ago. Years. I mean, yeah. they were they were the <laughs> challengers to the Absolutely. Labour Party. They were the ones who have been consistently in second place. Now they say they're fighting yeah. for third Peter, place Peter, with Peter, UKIP. I mean, you were out of sight. You've held the seat really for all but five years yeah. since the Second World War. But yeah, we want to be challenging Labour across the country. And if we're not challenging Labour across the country Absolutely. in Hartlepool tonight, I'll be disappointed. But I think the, the main little phrase I suspect not natural to I suspect, coming up. I suspect <laughs> that we may see that the main story from Hartlepool is what's going to Labour support. I mean, the big issue, well, the underlying pattern here is voters moving away from Labour. The challenge for my party, which I fully understand, is to get those people to move to us. But they're certainly moving from Labour. OK, just before I come back to Peter Hayne on that point, um, Roger Knapman, uh, can you be any more um, confident than any of the rest of our guests about how things are looking? And uh, do you think you're actually going to manage to force the Conservatives into fourth place? Well, we fought exactly two dozen by-elections over the last few years, and in only one of those have we retained our deposit. Uh, so we look forward, I think, with some confidence to retaining our deposit. Uh, if we could get uh, anything towards double figures, be very, very pleased indeed. To beat the Conservatives would be have quite profound political implications, I think. We have a very good local candidate in Steve Allison and certainly deserve to do well because we fought a spirited campaign. But you're not sounding too optimistic about the prospects of uh, squeezing out the Tories. I'd prefer to be optimistic in an hour's time rather than now. OK, uh, Peter Hayne, just to go back to uh, the point that David Willits was making there, um, is that the history of the last few by-elections has not been a good one for Labour. Well, we're in our eighth year of government. Governments this long into their inter office, as the Tories found when they were in office for a long period, tend to be in a, in, in a situation where voters don't like to support them much in by-elections. The turnout is low compared with general elections and they normally get a bit of a, a hammering. Now the fact that we are actually in a position to keep winning these by-elections and fighting very closely uh, whether and usually with the Liberal Democrats at this stage and that the Tories, the alternative government, I mean they are claiming under Michael Howe to challenge us for power to win the next general election. The fact that they are out of sight fighting for third or maybe it being pitched into fourth place is a very, very savage commentary on them. And I think uh, we're in a strong position still to win the next general election. David, you do need to start getting some momentum from these sorts of by-elections, don't you? But I think, oddly enough, what Peter Hayne just said about the alternative government is the clue here that when it comes to a general election, people are choosing an alternative government and at the next general election there will only be two credible alternative governments on offer, either sticking with Labour or moving to us. The dynamics of by-elections are very different and especially as British society changes and as there are more and more specific political parties targeting people with strong views, be it on Europe or Iraq, so people take by-elections as an opportunity to signal their strong views on the particular okay, well, not to choose an alternative it, government. On, on the, just Hughes on this for, point, the okay. Tories are actually winning by-elections in the late 70s when they swept us out of power okay, in 1979. We were winning by-elections against the, them the when we swept them out of the Liberal power. The Liberal Democrats have been winning some by-elections, but do you accept that point from David Willits there, that these are by-elections, uh, it's a protest for vote, Iraq is a big issue, it's going to be very different when people come to choosing the next government? I mean, a perfectly valid point and question. Let me just put them both together. I look today, as you would expect me to do, preparing for the programme at the by-elections. The Tories last won a by-election from Labour in the 70s, in the 70s. And they used to win most of the by-elections against Labour. When Labour lost, the Tories won, 50s, 60s, 70s. In the 80s, it was us who won, uh, and we have won the two in the last couple of years. So all the movement appears now not to be back to the Tories. David's question, will the next election be only a choice between Labour and the Tories? I don't think so, is the answer. I think people don't look now to the Tories as a natural sole alternative. I think they're less credible than they've ever been. They've had their worst two general election results that they've had since the middle of the 19th century. And no, it's three party politics. And I think we're in the best position to put ourselves forward as an alternative. And the Tories are in the worst position now. Three party politics, Peter? Three party politics, but I think things are looking good for us in Hartlepool. I'm quite encouraged. Uh, and as I say, if we're in the position, which we might be, to hold this seat at this stage in an election when we're told the Prime Minister has no trust in the country, Iraq is the dominating issue, didn't come up off the doorsteps I didn't find in the in Hartlepool by election. If we're in that position, then we're in a strong position to win the next election. 
David, you've got your party conference coming up next week. Um, if you don't do well in this by-election, it's hardly going to uh, lift the troops of your party. You, you need to try to get some sense that you are starting to make some inroads into Labour's vote. Yes, I think what we'll be looking to at the party conference is to tackle the underlying question, which is that that Tony Blair and the failure of Tony Blair to deliver has made has created a wider problem of trust, a problem of trust that is affecting even people's confidence in the ability of other parties to make a difference. What they want, what you find a governor the doorstep all the time is, Blair has let us down, how can we be confident that you will be any different? That's what we're going to be tackling at the party conference. Very briefly, Peter, anything, any firmer news from Hartlepool that you're hearing? Well, I'm quite encouraged from what I'm hearing. And I've always been quite confident about this uh, campaign. These are voices through the air ah. coming. Ah, <laughs> ah yes. Somewhere. But the you know, we fought a very good campaign. Yeah. We've got an excellent Martin candidate in Ian Wright, and the people trusted him. Oh, well. And, you know, just the attack on the Prime Minister. The Labour Party Minister. machine, fantastic the way it keeps its troops up to the up to the minute we're of course expecting that result hopefully sometime shortly but let's first catch up on the weather prospect now let's move back to some politics a little closer to home now and the voters of Hartlepool as we've been saying have been selecting a replacement for Peter Mandelson the Labour MP resigned his seat to take a job as European Commissioner for Trade he left a hefty Labour majority of more than 14,000 but the Liberal Democrats have been doing well in recent by-elections well, Peter Hayne, the leader of the Commons, is here. Simon Hughes, President of the Liberal Democrats. And David Willits, the Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. We've also got in Bristol, the leader of the UK Independence Party, Roger Knappman. Um, Peter Hayne, the whisper on the streets is that you've held on to this seat. I'm very encouraged. I'm pretty confident. We've had an excellent candidate in Ian Wright, a local man, and when you went round with him, everybody knew he was the local man compared with other candidates. And we fought a very good campaign. Hartley Pools had a fantastic deal from the Labour government with unemployment falling, with uh, more jobs, with better health services, better schools, better school results as well. And in these circumstances, where reading the paper over the papers over the last week or so, you'd have thought the Prime Minister had lost the entire trust of the country. You'd have thought the Labour Party was on its last legs, judging by the newspapers. Here we can hold a by-election in our eighth year of office, uh, in circumstances where the Conservatives before us were losing by-elections almost on the trot. Simon Hughes, will you be disappointed not to have won this? Yeah, it's always disappointing not to win a by-election. <laughs> Uh, but let's look at the figures. Labour got 60% of the vote last time. Three out of five voters in Hartlepool voted for them. My judgment is that it would be something like two out of five voters. So they will have lost one in three of their voters this time. On a lower turnout? Uh, on on a, yeah, turnout. of course, by-elections yeah. always have a lower turnout. But, exactly. but in general terms, so the, the securing the trust point is slightly weakened. And if it's as close as it could be, if it's within a 1,000 or something of that order, uh, in a seat which, as we were discussing before, the Tories have been second consistently since they last held it, which they did in the 60s. We have always been third, always been third since the last war. I have to say that it's a good result for us, pretty shaky result for Labour, and another disastrous result for the Tories. David Willett, so we're here that you're um, struggling away there to between third and fourth place with the UK Independence Party. Um, that's pretty disappointing, isn't it, given the amount of discontent that there is with the Labour government at the moment? It is disappointing if the discontent with Labour has not been translated into support for us. Yes, I wouldn't disguise that would be a disappointment. But the overall phenomenon is that people do feel let down by this government and the challenge for us, the challenge for us and the Conservative Party is to convert that in positive support for us. And if Why aren't we... they voting <laughs> for you then? I think, that what, I think that what's happening is that this, this, what we're finding is this corrosive loss of trust is not just a loss of trust in the Prime Minister, though he's the person who is above all culpable. And it's not even just affecting the Labour government, it's affecting all of us in politics. So the challenge for us, and it's particularly important as a challenge as the main opposition party, is to show how we would do things differently, how the things that we say we can deliver, how we'll only promise the things that we can confident we can do in government, how all our promises are credible and measured. And I think that's very much the tone that we'll be adopting at our conference last week because of this problem of loss of trust. Okay, David, Roger Knappman, let me just uh, quickly bring in uh, Roger Knappman. Um, how are things looking for you? Do you think you might have uh, succeeded in uh, piffing the Conservatives? Well, I think it's very, very close. I'm quite prepared to believe that the uh, Labour Party have won this by-election, uh, but I'm not yet prepared to uh, concede that we're necessarily fourth. 
Uh, certainly it looks as though we're having our best result ever. Admittedly, the, um, since I earlier said we've only saved our deposit once, that doesn't take a lot of doing, but certainly it looks much, much better than we've ever done before. And as for the thought just now, we're into three-party politics, can I just remind you that in the European elections, we came third, the Liberals actually came fourth. So we're no longer in three-party politics, we're in four-party politics mode. Peter Hayne, we're in four-party politics mode now. Well, what we're in is a situation where the, the party posing as the alternative government is now fighting its it out for fourth place, scrapping with the United Kingdom Independence Party. It's a disaster for Michael Howard. He was supposed to rescue the Conservatives and take them forward. And I think the Conservative conference next week is going to be a very demoralized conference because they're so badly out of shape, because they do not have the policies or the leadership to provide a strong, credible alternative but, but government Pete, for the David country. David Willis, you, it's, it's a very difficult situation yeah, but for you, I mean, is, is going on and say this. Let's just get clear what's happened in the but, past but two fact, years. Uh, Let's, let, what's happened in the past two years is indeed the frustration that the Conservative Party is not as moved up in the way that I'd have hoped. But the, by far the most important single electoral event is the steady decline of support for Labour. That is the thing that has been happening over the past two years. And the Peter. growth of support for the well, Liberal Democrats. Then, and then the people who are moving away from Labour are moving everywhere. But, but They're David, moving to a whole range of different parties, and it's quite right. I wish that more of them yeah. were moving to us. If, but if the crucial thing is they're all moving from you, Peter. That was, is the most important single thing that's happening well, in British if, politics if that at the moment. Was the case, then we would be being hammered in by-elections like you were like you were hammering us in the late 1970s when you win, went to win and Mrs Thatcher won in 1979. The fact is, we are losing votes in by-elections as all governments do. That's an electoral fact on a low turnout. 20% fewer people voted in uh, Hartlepool this time. and A lot of those would have been Labour supporters, expecting us to win anyway, probably. The real lesson of this by-election is the collapse in the Conservative vote and the crisis if in Peter, Michael Howard's okay, leadership. I'm going to stop you Labour just for a moment. Not David, Willits, and, uh, so David not... Willits, Simon Hughes, Peter Hayne. Uh, well, I'm just going to stop you for a moment because we're shortly going to be joined by viewers on BBC One. Uh, who are joining us as we still wait for the by-election result, which we hope will be in the next few minutes. Now you're watching a now you're watching a BBC News special. <coughs> Now you are watching a BBC News special on BBC One and BBC News 24. This is the scene live in Hartlepool where the final votes are being counted in the election to find the replacement for Peter Mandelson. The Labour MP resigned his seat to take a job as European Commissioner for Trade. He left a hefty Labour majority of more than 14,500. But the Liberal Democrats have been doing well in recent by-elections. The turnout at today's poll is thought to have been quite low. Early estimates from party officials suggest the figure may be around 40 per cent. That compares to more than 56 per cent at the general election. Well, we'll return to Hartlepool when we get the result. Of course, we'll bring it to you straight away. But uh, first of all, back here in the studio, we have Peter Hayne, the leader of the Commons, Simon Hughes, president of the Liberal Democrats, and David Willits, the shadow work and pensions secretary, all here eagerly um, awaiting and anticipating this result. Um, David Willits, for the Conservatives, it's not looking too good for you. The word that we're hearing is it looks as though Labour has narrowly hung on to this. There has been a big swim, swing to the Liberal Democrats, but it's not good for you. Well, it's clearly disappointing if we are third, and that would be something that I would regret. But what's happening is that, as we're finding on the doorsteps all across the country, there's been a loss of trust in Labour. What we have yet to do is to convert that into a commanding lead for us. I understand that. But the thing is that people commanding no longer lead. trust, no <laughs> longer believe that lead. Tony Blair or this Labour government are going lead. to stand by the promises they made at previous elections. Uh, Peter Hayne, do you think you've hold, held on to this seat then? I think we've held on to it and I think that's a very good result for us with a good candidate. Ian Wright was a local man. He was respected in the community when you went round with him. People liked him. But it is a catastrophic result for the Conservatives and for Michael Howard. They are putting themselves forward as the alternative government. When they were last in a position to defeat Labour in the late 1970s, they were cleaning us out of safe Labour seats like Ashfield. They should have been doing the same to us in Hartlepool. Now they're scrapping it out for fourth place with the United Kingdom 
Referendum Independence Party, a fringe party in every sense of the term. And I think that with this shows that actually underlying all the attacks on Tony Blair's leadership and all that stuff that we've seen swirling around before our conference this week, actually the, the, the voters want a government to continue with our economic success record of the longest period of growth and high employment and our public services investment as the voters of Hartlepool will experience. Okay. Simon Hughes, the Liberal Democrats have done quite well in recent by-elections. Are you They're disappointed that it doesn't look as though you've done it this time? Well, of course, one would like to win, but um, the three by-elections which we've had recently have produced two wins for the Liberal Democrats from third place, overtaking the Tories, and another where we just were a couple of hundred votes behind from third place, overtaking the Tories. Uh, last election, Labour had 60% of the vote, 6 in 10 voters voted for them, 2 in 10 for the Tories, 15% for us. It looks as if we've not just overtaken the Tories, but shot past them, leaving them in the Labour eye yet again. And David really can't get away with this stuff that, oh, well, we're lover commandingly. The Tories are going nowhere. They're not winning any seats. They're not coming second in the seats. They're even struggling to come third in a seat. Let's be clear about what's happening. What's <laughs> happening in British politics at the moment is support is moving away from Labour. Support but not moving, to you, support David. Support is moving away from Labour <laughs> all over the place. Support is moving <laughs> Mainly to, to us. Mainly no, to us. No, but if you're supposed to be the main opposition, shouldn't it be moving to you? I would, I would indeed wish that much more of this support was moving, was moving to us. You're quite right. Right. That's why, if we are indeed not winning this seat, and if we are third, that is bad news. But however, the, however, the point is <laughs> that the big event of the past 18 months has been a loss of trust in Tony Blair and this Labour government, and people are looking at the parties that have a different view on Iraq, they're looking at parties that are preoccupied with Europe. Who Many the people are coming well, to us. Let's, let's, the let's just bring in, let's just bring in, because you've talked, about, you've talked about some of the other parties. I want to bring in Roger Knappman, who's uh, down the line talking to us from our studio in Bristol. Um, Roger Knappman, what are you hearing on the ground? Do you think that you have actually managed to push the Conservatives into fourth place? Well, I'm trying to find out. Actually, I just think we're very, very close. And uh, this is going to be obviously the story of the uh, by-election. Uh, it's not easy for us to fight by-elections because the traditional parties can concentrate all their resources. And on this particular occasion, of course, they've had massive publicity because both the Labour and the Liberal uh, parties have had their conferences. That's been a massive advantage to them over the last few weeks. Nevertheless, there we are, uh, very, very close to the Conservatives. I wish we'd fought the seat during the general election and we'd be doing even better, but we're certainly doing far better than we've ever done before in a by-election. You, you, you say that, but you don't think that you've actually managed to uh, overtake the Conservatives as some in your party had been confidently predicting? Well, I'm not sure who in our party was confidently predicting anything. What I do say is that I believe it's very, very close from what I can gauge, but uh, Bristol is not the best place to judge what's happening in Hartlepool. <laughs> OK. Saying uh, of the night, though. <laughs> Um, Peter, Peter Hain, um, David Willits, though, does have a point, though, doesn't he? Uh, we've got opinion poll after opinion poll suggesting not just that your party is very unpopular, but this whole issue of trust is now very, very significant. And an awful lot of it is focused on the leadership of Tony Blair. He's now saying he's going to carry on and serve a third term. Well, Carol, I realise you've got to pr pr repeat the mantra, and David's doing a manful job to explain a dismal result well, in a, the best possible way. Well, it's a fact, though, that but trust, is a, big, uh, trust is, a is a big issue. Tony Blair himself has trust admitted Trust is that. a problem for all of British politicians, and the Prime Minister's taken a hit, as has the government on Iraq and other issues. But if this were the full story that we've been told in the newspapers and by the Conservatives over the last few weeks, then we would have been hounded out of Hartlepool. The truth is, despite all this noise and background of the pr attacks on the Prime Minister, we have probably held a seat in circumstances in our eighth year of office where governments usually lose seats as the Conservatives uh, were winning them from us when they won in 1979. Now they're nowhere in sight and that is why, at the risk of repeating myself, I think that this is a real crisis for the Tories, that they cannot even challenge uh, the government in by-elections like this when they held the seat, by the way. They actually won the seat in the 1960s and they've been second all the way along for as long as anybody can remember. And we're seeing some seat. pictures of a, a pretty, pretty confident, relaxed, happy looking uh, Ian Wright, the Labour Party candidate. Uh, let's there. just get the history right. It's been a Labour seat for all but five years since 1945. When you held it? 
It, it has been the it, you, you have you, it has been a Labour seat for all but five years since 1945, yeah. Peter. We have got currently second, four then, councillors. Then some first. We have currently, sadly, only four councillors in Hartlepool. I would love us to be. You have always been second. I am not. Been David, second. let me I'm, ask you: Where can you win a by-election now? Where can you win a by-election well, now? I would like us, as a national party, to be winning by-elections across the country. That but is what are. I believe in. And I, if we are third, I will be disappointed that we're not winning this seat. You're absolutely right that the challenge for the Conservative Party is to reach out as a national party. However, I think that. Peter, as a representative of a governing party, which is finding itself facing, uh, I think, a catastrophic loss of trust, which it is bringing down on other parties You've as well. To say, oh, the problem is the Tories. There is a question as well, though, about complacent. your party's performance. You are supposed to be the main party of opposition. Michael Howard uh, had some pretty good momentum when he first took over the leadership. But there is a real risk now that people are going to be start to, to say, look, he's not winning us these by-elections. He's not giving us the sort of momentum which we would be hoping to have at this stage. We're perhaps a, a general election seven months or so down the line. Well, if you look at the overall results and the biggest elections that we've had this year in June, you can see in the, according to the European elections, the London Assembly, and of course the local council elections, where we gained significant ground. But you're right, the challenge that we will face, and it's a challenge that we'll be facing next week at our party conference is to put before the electorate proposals that convince them that a Conservative government would make their life better, would make our country a better place, would tackle the problems that they're worried about. And if we have failed to do that at Hartlepool, then that just means we have to redouble our efforts at our party conference next week and beyond. Simon Hughes, do you think that you really will be able to translate the sort of success that you had in Leicester South? You, you haven't won tonight, but it does look as though there has been a swing to your party. These are by-elections, though, and we know the history of by-elections are that they don't necessarily reflect how people are going to vote when they are voting for a government. No, of course they're different. By-elections are your chance to protest and decide on local issues and local candidates. General and you've elections. made a big thing of, of the Iraq war. Yes, D didn't really play in Hartlepool for reasons that were declared earlier. It's a 99% white constituency. It's not a mixed race constituency. It doesn't have mixed faith, uh, and it's very much its own Does town. Does that mean that Iraq doesn't play in any area where there's not a no, large ethnic minority no, constituency? No, no, but it plays oh. much more in Brent, and it played much more in Leicester, and it played much more in Birmingham. Um, but. The basis of our support is uh, improvement over the last few years. All the opinion polls show us uh, in the 20s. Opinion poll last weekend in the News of the World showed us ahead of the, the Labour Party. Um, opinion poll also last weekend showed us jostling. It's three-party politics at least, at least. Okay. And, and the prospects for us look as if by-elections and general elections consistently we're going up. Tories hate to say it but the opposition votes are coming from Labour to us and not to the Tories. OK, I'll give you all a chance to come back on that. Uh, Simon Hughes, Peter Hayne, uh, David Willits and uh, Roger Knappman in Bristol. Uh, stay with us because we're coming back to you. But uh, we are hoping to get that result in the not too distant future. I think we can see now there the candidates gathering in the expectation that a result might not be too far away. Our correspondent Vicky Young is there and I hope she can join us now. Vicky, what are you hearing from there in Hartlepool? Well, we are very close to results, I think, in the next few minutes or so. Now, this is very unscientific, but looking at the piles of papers uh, over there on the tables, it looks like Labour have won, certainly not by a majority of 14,500, which is what they were defending. Um, and it looks very, very close between third and fourth. That's between the Conservative and the UK Independence Party. So two battles going on here, really. Um, I think if the, the Tories have had a very poor showing here, it looks like uh, their, their share of the vote may well have halved. So a miserable night, really, for the Tories. The Lib Dems have made uh, huge gains, but I don't think quite enough possibly uh, to take this seat, as they have done, obviously, in those other spectacular by-election wins uh, around the country recently. Vicky, you've been there following this campaign very closely. What have been the, the big issues? It's certainly been a local campaign, if you like. All the candidates really concentrating on local issues uh, about the possible closure of Hartlepool Hospital, things like crime and social disorder, those kind of issues. There was a rather bizarre competition going on between the candidates as to who was the most local. Lots of people felt the campaign was pretty bitter. It became a bit too personality-based. Uh, I think that turned off a lot of the voters, actually. Um, so I think issues like Iraq probably not playing as much as they have done in, in seats like Leicester uh, and Brent, which, of course, 
was to the Liberal Democrats' advantage. I think they haven't had that here, really. There's not a big uh, Muslim vote here which may have swung behind them. And I think probably that's been the difference here, actually, tonight. And very briefly, uh, Peter Mandelson, not such a big factor, the fact that he uh, left Hartlepool to go off to Brussels. No, I don't think so. There wasn't much talk of him really around here. I think lots of people, lots of local people saying the great thing about having Peter Mandelson as their MP was that, in fact, it gave Hartlepool um, an awful lot of publicity. And I don't think that will be the case. Whoever wins here tonight, I don't think you're going to get the same uh, kind of publicity here. So that wasn't really a huge factor. Labour really campaigning on the fact they had a very local candidate. He's uh, a local councillor. He lives in the town with his children. I think that was probably uh, a factor which is, is won it for them this evening. OK, Vicky, thanks very much indeed for now. Of course, we'll be straight back to Hartlepool as soon as we know that that result is going to be announced. Um, but first, uh, back to our studio, Peter Haynes, Simon Hughes, David Willits and Roger Knapman is down the line in uh, Bristol. Uh, Peter Hayne, there does seem to have been quite a big swing away from your party, although perhaps you've managed to hang on to this seat. Well, as I say, the fact that we've managed to hang on to it, I think quite comfortably in the circumstances, in the situation where everybody's been saying the Prime Minister is finished, that the party's in, in, uh, on, on the run, is evidence that that is not the case, that where we put an effective campaign on the ground, we can win. And I just want to say something about the campaign. This is a very interesting development now. We have at last stopped this Liberal... Uh, street fighting effective by-election machine. We've taken them on at their own game and we've fought them off. Now they've had a very successful, I have to hand this to them, a very successful formula in by-elections for taking Conservative seats and as we saw at Brent East notably where they wiped the floor with us uh, and to some extent in, in Leicester South though less so. Uh, difficulties for us as well. Now we've now got a strategy in place and Fraser Kemp who headed it, uh, the, the, the Labour MP and his colleague Tom Watson MP, have masterminded a brilliant strategy which I think gives us a lot of confidence for taking on the Lib Dems at local council level and in by-elections where we need to. Simon Hughes, your <laughs> street fighting machine has been stopped in its tracks. Well, absolutely. I, I don't, stopped in its tracks, four by-elections, we win two and the Labour Party very nearly We're lose the other two. This. We're getting <laughs> better, Simon. All I can say, my calculate, rough and ready calculations is that the swing is about 22 and a half percent. I may be a bit out from what I'm hearing. Now, I have to say, again, I've done rough and ready. That's 150 Labour seats would go to us if that was the result. <laughs> no, but you know, it, you can't, it can't automatically be that. translate things. Of like course, that, as no, we've Carol. Been of course, saying. but I'm trying to suggest that stopping us in our tracks when there's a swing of 22 and a half percent is hardly the common understanding out there of stopping somebody in their tracks in politics. I mean, we we hope to win more and more seats at the next election from Labour and the Tories. Who knows whether there'll be a, another by-election? This was not the seat we would have chosen to fight. It wasn't to use the phrase the Tories use, our natural territory. Uh, we had a brilliant candidate. Yes, she actually didn't happen to have been born in Hartlepool. She never said she was. Labour did play the, uh, I think, the right man from the town for the town. And, yeah. it, and it is a very parochial place, and I accept that. And that was it's a strong a card. Place, of course it's a proud place. Campaign, no, 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 you no. ran the town down. No, no, we didn't run the town you did. down. No, it we came never off the doorstep. Your candidate no, was running the no, town down. No, no, we never ran. It was a proud place. But it is a parochial place, and that's fair enough. You're entitled to stand up for your town. But it was very much not on national issues. It was very much on local issues. David Willis, do you think you've got to have a pretty serious rethink about your campaign and how you're approaching these elections? Uh, for example, in I mean, Leicester South, you absolutely poured. MPs were being bussed up there to get out and about. Um, it didn't do you a lot of good there. And it doesn't look as though it's a very good result for you tonight. Well, we'll wait and see what happens. But yeah, we do need to think. Well, it looks pretty about, clear you've been pushed yeah, into at least well, third yeah, or possibly fourth do, place. The answer to your question is yes, we do need to think about how we project and explain conservatism in 21st century Britain. That is the challenge for our party. So there's nothing exactly wrong with the policies, the it's just the well, way that you're selling them. I mean, the, the, no, I mean, we have a party conference next week, and of course one of the interesting features of this, it was called after two party conferences and before we'd had ours. But the one thing we must do absolute, with absolute concentration and focus next week is show that everything we do is to try to make today's Britain a better place. And if our party is not thought to be tackling the problems of today's Britain, then we will not gain the way I want to see our party do. Now, I can just tell you that uh, we were talking there that you might be pushed into fourth place. 
we are hearing that it's possible that there's going to be a recount to see who comes third and fourth. It looks as though what we're hearing is that Labour may well have held on to this seat, but that it is very tight indeed between the Conservatives and the UK Independence Party and that there is the possibility, it's not certain yet, uh, that there will be a recount to see who has come third. Well, I think at this stage, we better bring in Roger Knapman from the UK Independence Party. Uh, it looks as though you're coming very close to uh, squeezing the Conservatives out. Well, uh, yes, uh, uh, such information that I'm getting suggests that it's so close as to uh, be very difficult to judge at all. But if it is true that we're getting each of us something like 10% of the votes, then that is very, very significant breakthrough for UKIP. Uh, and uh, I've been looking actually, and Simon Hume, Hughes is there, uh, actually the Liberal Party, as it then was, managed to get six seats on 2.5% of the vote in the 1950s. Now, if we're starting to get 10% in first-past-the-post elections, then the potential is, of course, there in the general election next year. But we've been talking a bit about campaigns. Your campaign there in Hartlepool was very much based on your core message on Europe. Oh, no, no. Uh, no. Steve Allison was a very good local candidate, and we dwelt almost entirely on local issues, the hospital, uh, the ships uh, that are to be cleaned up or possibly not cleaned up, in Hartlepool, that sort of thing. So we did dwell on the local issues. And um, if it is true that the other three parties all want to subcontract sub government to, to Brussels, then of course that is an issue with some. But uh, we certainly don't dwell on that over much. We're told that it's probably going to be a, a, at least another 10 or 15 minutes before we get this result now. Um, David Willis, just to come back to you there, though, if we are in this situation where we're actually having to have a recount to find out whether you've been pushed into fourth place, isn't this going to lead to some pretty serious soul-searching within your party, especially just ahead of that party conference which you were just talking about? Well, the party conference is our opportunity. Mm. It's our opportunity to show that we are indeed hearing the messages which we're getting all the time on the doorstep, that people are fed up with Blair, they're fed up with Labour, they don't trust them anymore. More, but they want to know that there is a practical and deliverable conservative alternative. That is indeed the challenge facing our party. Now, I believe that on health, on education, on my particular area that I'm responsible for, on pensions, and more widely, we're offering that alternative. But if we have because if we have fourth, and we'll have to see, this is purely speculation at the moment, then obviously that means we have to do a lot better getting that across. But do you just um, try a bit harder to get the message across, or do you think a bit harder about what you stand for, and perhaps even who's leading you? No, absolutely not. I mean, the one thing that brought us down was the sense that the Conservative Party was endlessly engaged in sort of inter nissan warfare. The fact that we have a leader who was elected by the entire party, that we have who has authority and experience is a great asset for our party. No, getting back into all that would be madness. We're not going to do that. What we are going to have to do is show that the Conservative Party is addressing the problems of 21st century Britain. That's what we have to do, and that's what Michael is committed to doing. Peter Hayne, if we look at um, the result that we're getting uh, tonight and the results of the last few by-elections, are you going to have to rethink how you fight the next general election campaign? Are you going to have to have a campaign which is far more directly targeted at the Liberal Democrats and what they stand for? It's important to expose the Liberal Democrats when they fight elections because they're thoroughly opportunist. They'll campaign against anti-social, uh, campaign against a yobbery locally and then vote in Parliament against our government implementing measures that stop yobbery uh, in local communities. That's just one example. So I think they've the also... social behaviour orders. Indeed. And they've also shifted to the right in a number of areas and almost adopted a crypto-Thatcherite uh, policies <laughs> in the health service. <laughs> I think a bit of exaggeration So here. I think that it's important that we actually take them on and expose them. And when the electors are confronted with those facts, then they tend to see them in a different light. But I think the real issue here, in this, the real lesson of this by-election, is not just that the Liberals have done quite well, but that we've actually done much better than people thought. The real lesson here is twofold for the Conservatives. First, that their leader 
is unpopular. He was very good at the beginning, but he's been sl on the slide ever since. And that their policies don't add up, they do not pose a credible alternative government capable of challenging our record of a successful economy and record investment in public services. OK, I'm going to come back to David Willits on that point in a minute. But Simon Hughes, I can't say I've ever thought of you as a crypto Thatcherite, well, but, but what Pete, about those, the point, to, the, the point that Peter Hayne is making? Yeah. that you, you are, as a third party, you are saying one thing in seats you've got to take from the Tories right. and another in seats well, that you're going to take from Labour? The, the answer is that's absolutely not true because we have of a... Of it is. No, it's ab well, it's absolutely not true. It may have been 20 years ago, but absolutely not true. We have a pre-manifesto that will be uh, the basis of the manifesto across the country. And Peter, who's an intelligent man, must do better than misrepresent the position on important issues like law and order and the health service. Uh, the crypto Thatcherite view of the health service was a view expressed by one colleague which was entirely rejected and never part of official policy. Peter knows that perfectly well and I hope he'll say in a minute he accepts that we voted for an absolutely consistent by uh, public funding. By a by the way, one of a member yeah, of but, the Shadow Cabinet. No, no, but it, it, it was in a, in a book that wasn't party policy by but an individual which had been rejected. But Peter, uh, I mean, we, don't we have tell a, me the Labour Party now well, doesn't even allow anybody to say anything. No, 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 that's we nonsense. have an intelligent debate, but if you but, have people no, speaking for your party no, he doesn't speak on the health service. Replacing the health no, service no, with a social no, insurance well, policy. Well, all I'm saying to you is, and, the, and the viewers, however many there are at this hour in the morning, is that we <laughs> believe in a publicly funded NHS. On antisocial behaviour, I was responsible for the policy. We voted for large numbers of the measures from the government, the majority of bills, but not every measure in the bill. Of course we didn't, because some of them were very illiberal measures. And we're not going to row back from that. And we don't believe that you should have powers to disperse people who've done nothing wrong. We think that's a an, an profoundly illiberal and wrong approach. So, yes, quick point on this man here. Yes, let, let me just tell you that, first of all, we're now hearing that that threatened recount for third and fourth place is not taking place. So we do hope to have the result for you in the not too distant mm. future. It's always very difficult to read these things. We Don't see the candidates. Here, Carol. <laughs> no, we see the candidates. We've seen them getting ready. We've seen a very happy looking Labour candidate. The word we're getting is that it does look as though Labour has held on to this seat. We can see uh, Ian Wright there, the Labour candidate there, looking uh, quite happy. Uh, I think we can bring in Vicky Young, who's there in Hartlepool. Uh, Vicky, any indication of how long it might be before we actually get a result? I'd love to be able to tell you, Carol, there's a mass confusion now. We've, we heard, first of all, that there was going to be a recount between the Tories and uh, UKIP. Then we were told you can't do that. You can only do recounts between first and second place and if you're losing your deposit. We've now heard there might be a recount between first and second. So pretty much it's all very close. Um, looking, as I say, at these votes that have been stacking up here all throughout the evening, it does look like Labour might have done it, but I think it could be quite close. And there is a real, real battle going on there between uh, the Tories and UKIP for third and fourth and I mean if the Tories come fourth someone has said here that's probably the first time since the war that the main opposition party has come fourth in an English by-election so not a great first there for the Tories if that does happen uh, but we think there may be about 50 votes between UKIP and the Tories uh, so as soon as we know whether there are recounts for any of these things we'll, we'll let you know but we're certainly not quite there at a result yet I don't think. Classic uh, by-election this uh, we may have a recount we might not oh, have a recount hearing, yeah. somebody's won together. <laughs> You keep 149 ahead now, I'm hearing. <laughs> Right, well, well, we'll perhaps wait until we get the final declared result before we get too bogged down in the figures. But obviously, yes, we'll, we'll come straight back to you. But you've been very close, watching this campaign very closely. Um, what about the Conservative campaign? Uh, we've been hearing here that it looks as though they might be pushing the force. We've been hearing that it's been a very local campaign, a quite a vitriolic ca campaign between the Liberal Democrats and Labour. What about the Tories' campaign? I think they ran a decent campaign. I think the problem was they took a long time to decide on their candidate. That put them behind a bit. The Lib Dem by-election team moved in here absolutely weeks ago. A number of people here saying actually they've had so many leaflets from the Liberal Democrats that they're, you know, they've actually had enough of it, really. I think the Tories fell behind very early on there. It was going to be very difficult for them to make that up. Once the Liberal Democrats had established themselves as the main challengers to Labour, it's incredibly difficult from that point on for the Tories to come back from that. And really, there wasn't much evidence of their campaign team being 
uh, being everywhere like the Lib Dems and Labour were really. Labour fought this incredibly hard uh, and there was a very much this competition between the candidates as to who was the most local. The Tory candidate lives all the way away in Newcastle and that maybe held, was held against him um, and the Lib Dem uh, equally she was from Darlington there was a lot made of that by uh, the Labour campaign but I think it is definitely a miserable night for the Tories. The fact that they're scrapping out here with UKIP for that third or fourth place is not good news for them at all. Okay, Vicky Young for now. Thanks very much indeed. But um, let us know the latest on the various recounts that may or may not be taking place. Um, I'm joined uh, back in the studio as well as the rest of our panel now by uh, Professor Anthony King. Um, what do you make of what we're hearing so far from Hartlepool? Well, it sounds very much like by-elections as usual. Uh, you take Brent East, you take Leicester <coughs> South, you take Birmingham Hodge Hill and you add this one on and what do you get? You get a very, very sharp drop in the Labour vote. Uh, you get the Liberal Democrats doing well. The one point about the Liberal Democrats, before I come to the Tories, which you will insist I do, uh, is that the Liberal Democrats have a, a rather new problem. Once upon a time, if you didn't want to vote Labour and you didn't want to vote Conservative, you voted Liberal Democrat. But now, more and more uh, other candidates are appearing on the scene for respect, the Greens, UKIP or whatever. It's quite clear, I think, that Birmingham Hodge Hill was held by Labour and not gained by the Liberal Democrats because of the presence of a respect candidate. And I think when we actually have the results, we may well form the impression that had there been three or four candidates rather than 14, the Liberal Democrats might well have taken the seat. But the big news does continue to be, uh, uh, I hope viewers don't think that Peter Hayne has bribed me to say this, uh, because it does sound like what he's been saying. I think the big news is that the Conservatives have clearly done, whether they finish third or fourth, very badly indeed. I can just bring us a little bit more news on this, because despite all the confusion that we're hearing, there is now apparently a recount to see who is going to come third and who is going to come fourth. This, of course, is between the Conservatives and the UK mm -hmm. Independence Party. That is the latest news we have, that they are slugging it out to see who's going to come last and who's going to not quite come last. Well, that, this is absolutely awful from the Conservative Party's point of view, especially coming on the eve of their annual conference. Uh, the fact is there have been six by-elections in this Parliament. In five of the six seats, the Conservatives finished second at the last general election. It's uh, clear that they have finished fourth once in Ogmore. It looks as though they may finish fourth in Hartlepool, and they have finished a poor third in all but one of the other by-elections. Now, for the principal opposition party, confronted with a notoriously pretty unpopular government to be doing too bad that badly in the ballot box as well as in the opinion polls is just terribly bad news. And when Michael Howard took over the leadership, there was a new sense of vigour, of purpose. The party seemed quite united around him. From what you're reading and what you're seeing in the polls and your knowledge of these things, why do you think it is that the Conservatives are doing so badly? One of the paradoxes at the moment is that many of the Conservative-specific policies are actually quite popular. The Tories are leading Labour on Europe, for example, on crime, on immigration. It's the party itself that over a, uh, half a generation, really, that's become the problem. The people may like Tory policies, but they don't like the Tory party. Why? I think because it's become socially quite isolated. Every time there's a, a pro-hunt demonstration, that draws attention to the fact that the Conservative Party represents some rather strange people out there. Not many people identify with pro-hunt demonstrators. It also suggests that there are some serious ideological problems. I mean, most people don't think in right or left terms, but the fact is that the Tories are now seen as a very right-wing party, whereas Labour is seen to have drawn to the centre. OK, uh, Professor Anthony King, for now, thank you very much indeed. Uh, a quick comment from each of my guests. Uh, I'll have to start with David Willits for the Conservatives because you represent some pretty strange people. Well, I mean, what Professor That's what King, Anthony King is just uh, saying. To quote Professor King. <laughs> to quote him. What, this was rather was compressed. You know? I was <laughs> levelling with you earlier on this, Carol. I do think that the Conservative <coughs> Party has to show that we're comfortable with 21st century Britain. And the challenge for us, indeed, and it's a challenge we'll have to address at the party conference next week and beyond, 
is to show that conservatism works for people today in the same way as it did in the 20th or 19th century. That is the central challenge for our party. I accept that. But I just wanted to say, coming back to Peter, Very that briefly, Peter, Peter is endlessly saying, oh, well, look what's happened to the Tories. We do just have to confront the question of they have a, the event of the past 18 months is a governing party losing support. OK, it's losing Peter Hayne, briefly, because parties, we're coming up to the top of the air. You're losing support. Well, we've taken a hit in the by-elections, as all governments do. But to win a by-election in these circumstances, with everybody kicking the Prime Minister around, saying we've lost trust, is a really good result for us with a great local candidate and a great local campaign. Carol? Simon Hughes. The one thing I did my research, even uh, along the lines of Anthony earlier, the Tories have come forth in a by-election. They did so in 1991 in Walton. They have never in their history, never in their history, gone from first or second to fourth place. Never, 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 according to researchers since the middle of, well, since the Tory party was formed. It's a and disaster if they come, for them. And if, and if they disaster. have come forth from second place, it will be their absolutely worst result in relative terms for 150 or 200 years. Roger Knappman in Bristol, uh, briefly, it looks as though you're in a recount with the Tories to see who gets third place. Yes, I'm not aware that we've asked for the recount, and you can draw conclusions from that. Uh, but I wish that Professor King and all the other pundits who said that we'd get uh, admitted that 16% uh, was our uh, share of the vote in the European PR elections, and have been confidently predicting ever since, it would only keep a small proportion, perhaps 4% or whatever, a quarter of them, in a first-past-the-post election. Now, it's beginning to look as though we've got 10% plus, which means we've kept the vast majority of the voters that we got on June the 10th. That's hugely encouraging for UKIP. UKIP is the victor tonight. Uh, whether or not it comes third or fourth, uh, I hope uh, third, but 10% is going to be a jolly good result for us. OK, Roger Knappman for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, too, for a moment to Peter Hayne, Simon Hughes, David Willits and to Professor Anthony King. Um, we are still waiting for that result from Hartlepool. Uh, the recount is obviously going to delay the result. Um, but now, with the time approaching one o'clock, let's return to our other main story tonight. It's been revealed that the Prime Minister is to go into hospital later today to undergo treatment to correct a problem with the rhythm of his heart. It's thought that Mr Blair, who was treated in hospital last October for an irregular heartbeat and shortness of breath, will make a full recovery. The procedure does not involve a surgical incision and Mr Blair will remain conscious throughout. The treatment destroys short circuits within the heart which cause abnormal rhythms. It's effective and has a success rate of more than 90%. During the procedure, a catheter is inserted into the groin and directed into the heart. The patient is given local anaesthetic to numb the area and should be able to return to work within days. Well, in a moment, we're going to be hoping to uh, get to the result from the by-election in Hartlepool. Um, but, of course, the big, other big news this evening Once is that news from Tony Blair, made, that he's having another operation tomorrow. To uh, he's also set out very clearly his determination to serve a full third term in office, but not a fourth to term. Um, um, Peter Hayne, what do you think that statement from Tony Blair is going to do? He clearly wants to try to prevent it, a new round of speculation about his future. Is this statement going to achieve it, though? <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not confident and it'll stop uh, the world of journalism or other politicians speculating about it. But what I do think it shows is some certainty. Everybody knows that we will go into the next general election now with the Prime Minister intending to govern, not to retire, to govern for the full term and then not to go on and on and on like Mrs Thatcher, but to stand down and at the, the right time before the following general election and say, well, now the Labour Party can choose a new leader. I think it's to his credit. I think people know where he is. And I think he's a prime minister really at the peak of his powers, who's taken the economy into its most successful phase in living memory, continued public investment. We will continue that uh, if we win the next term of office with him uh, continuing to lead the country. David Willis, does this um, spike your efforts to have a vote Blair get Gordon Brown uh, uh, thrust in the next election campaign? Well, I mean, first of all, can I just say that, of course, as we all do very much, the Prime Minister's operation is a success and it all goes smoothly. On the Prime Minister, the, the crucial point is that the Prime Minister himself is the crucial figure in the loss of right. trust in Labour and Right, I'm going to have government. to stop you there because it looks as though we can now get that result from Hartlepool. 
We can see the returning officer standing up there on the stage, the candidates assembling around him. In this day of the electronic media, the internet, we still have a good old-fashioned way of announcing the results in the by-election. The candidates waiting there. There's been a lot of confusion. We were waiting for quite some time to see if there was going to be a recount to see who was in third or fourth place. The word has been that Labour has held on here. We are just waiting to get the full result now. It looks as though the Tories could well have been squeezed into fourth place by the UK Independence Party. Uh, it looks as though there has been a big swing to the Liberal Democrats, but not on this occasion. I, Carl Richardson, being the returning officer for the election of a Member of Parliament for the Hartlepool constituency, held on Thursday, 30th of September 2004, do hereby give notice that the number of votes recorded for each candidate at the said election is as follows. Edward Abrams, 41 votes. English Democrat. Stephen Allison, 3,193 votes. The UK Independence Party vote. Philip Berryman, 90 votes. The Independent candidate. John Anthony Bloom, 572 votes. To save our hospital campaigner. Ronnie Carroll, 45 votes. Another independent. Geordie Dunn, 10,719 votes. That's the Liberal Democrat. Paul Michael Watson, Fathers for Justice, 139 votes. Fathers for Justice candidate. Christopher Harriet, 95 votes. Alan, also known as Howling Lord Hope, 80 votes. The official monster raving loony party. Jeremy Peter Middleton, 3,044 votes. That's the Conservative. Richard Thomas Boycott Rogers, 91 votes. Iris Ryder, 255 votes. James William Starkey, 246 votes. That's National Fund, Britain for the British. Ian David Wright, 12,000. 752 votes. The total number of votes rejected was 31 votes. And I do hereby declare that the said Ian David Wright is duly elected a Member of Parliament for the said constituency. Well That's Ian Wright there, the Labour Party candidate who has won this seat. It looks like here that the Conservatives have fallen into fourth place. He's now coming up to make his speech. Let's hear what Ladies and gentlemen, say. there are an awful lot of people I need to thank, but at first I need to make a few comments. Tonight's victory is very sweet because it's a victory for people who believe in the truth. It is a victory for people who believe in our National Health Service, who believe in investing in better schools, and who believe that governments are voted in to make Britain better for the many and not the few. The hard-working families of Hartlepool have shown they believe in a Labour government that has seen unemployment in our town fall by almost half since 1997 that has put record investment into our schools so that our children can achieve record results and which is once again making the NHS the envy of the world. Tonight's result is great news for Tony Blair. A huge, a huge disappointment for Charles Kennedy and an absolute disaster for Michael Howard. Seven years, seven years into the Thatcher government, 
The Tories lost by-election after by-election. But tonight, it is obvious that Michael Howard cannot win a by-election. He's not been leader of his party for even a year. And yet we already know that the topic on every pair of Tory lips next week will be who will replace him after the Tories suffer another crushing election defeat. And no wonder, who could ever vote for a party led by a man responsible for three million on the dole, the poll tax, and 15% mortgage rates? Of course, the Liberal Democrats came here thinking that Hartlepool would be a pushover. They said the length of the campaign was a gift to them. They thought that a poll caused by the voluntary resignation of a sitting Labour MP would be a simple victory. But in fact, the long campaign here meant that the Lib Dems were exposed to scrutiny and they fell apart. The people of this town won't be fooled by the empty rhetoric of the Lib Dems. And we won't stand to be insulted by anyone who thinks it is amusing to mock us. Harleypool voted for hope tonight. We rejected the Tory myth that a fairer society can only be at the cost of a poorer society. We rejected the liberal myth that freedom to live must mean freedom to do harm to others. We voted for more jobs, more investment. We voted for a stronger police force. I have always been proud to be from Hartlepool, but I have never been prouder than tonight. The reason I am so proud of this town is because of its people. They kept faith with Labour and I thank them all. I want to thank my wife, Tiff, Without her, I would not have been able to be here tonight. And of course, Benjamin, Jacob, Hattie, and the newborn have always been more important to me than anything. And I want to thank them too. I want to thank my family, my mom, my dad, my nana, my brothers. Nana, if only granddad were here. Ladies and gentlemen, the police and the returning officers' staff have done their usual and excellent work. Because of them, we have been able to have that thing we all take too much for granted, a free and fair election. Of course, my friends and colleagues from Hartlepool Labour Party have done an excellent job and have worked hard throughout. And I also want to thank Emma Thorne, my agent, and her staff who have kept me busy and kept me sane for eight long weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, this victory is both for me and for this town. For seven years now, we have been on the up, slowly rising out of the long years of decline under the Tories. For Labour's victory tonight is only the fanfare for next year's general election and the third successive Labour victory that it will bring. Thank you, Hartlepool. Thank you for the chance you have given me and thank you for keeping faith with Labour's renewal. Ladies and gentlemen of Hartlepool, I am proud of you and I hope you can be proud of me. Thank you. And that was Ian Wright, the new Labour MP for Hartlepool. He's held on to that seat, the seat that used to be Peter Mandelson's. His majority, that was 14,000 at the last election, has been reduced to just over 2,000, but Labour have held on to that seat. If we can look at the result, Ian Wright, 12,752. The Liberal Democrats coming in second place there. The UK Independence Party, uh, they have come in third place pushing the Conservatives into fourth. And let's bring in now uh, Peter Haynes, Simon Hughes, David Willits and Roger Knapman from UKIP, who is uh, down in Bristol. And we've also got with us Professor Tony King. Um, Peter Haynes, first of all, well, congratulations. You've held on. Um, a victorious speech there from Ian Wright. Uh, I think Downing Street might have had a hand yeah. in that. Um, he was saying that this was um, 
good news for Tony Blair and disastrous news for the Tories? It's terrific news for Tony Blair. After a week in which he's been hammered in the newspapers and by the critics, and of course his, he and his family are now very concerned about the procedure tomorrow, as we all are, and we're thinking of them. It's great news for him. It's great news for us as a Labour government. Into our eighth year of government, in a situation where most governments get defeated, we've actually held on to the seat with a good result and in a, with an excellent campaign and an excellent local candidate who I found a... on the doorstep was really trusted and supported by local people. But there was a big swing to the Liberal Democrats. This was a seat which at the general election you had a majority of 14,000 brought down to just around 2,000 tonight. Yes, and a fall in the turnout down from around 60% uh, down to 40%, and that'll explain a lot of it. I'm not saying, uh, not as it were, explaining that this is exactly the same as a general election, but I think the key thing here and the key lesson here is we beat the Liberal Democrats in a seat they expected to win. They came in when they came in at the beginning of the election campaign very, very confident. We beat them. We ran a brilliant local campaign under Fraser Kemp. But the main news of tonight is an absolute catastrophe for the Conservative Party and for Michael Howard, who's shown that he simply isn't taking them anywhere. OK, and I'm going to come to David Willits for the Conservatives in a moment. But um, first of all, Simon Hughes, you expected to win it. You certainly no, really fought a very it. long and a very expected hard campaign. You must be Disappointed. Okay, no, we never expected. You don't expect to win seats where you've come you third. Did, no, no, we did not expect to win it, Peter. I can tell you, I've been six times. We didn't expect to win it. We were going to have a go. Are you disappointed? Came from, of course, because you like to win. But we were in third place before. We now are second. We came only two thousand. We were seventeen thousand votes behind Labour in, nine, in two thousand one. Seventeen thousand votes. We're now two thousand votes. The Tories have been not just overtaken, as I said earlier. They've been left in the lay-by and have been overtaken by UKIP. Their worst. The only time the Tories have gone from second to fourth since the Tory Party was formed. David Willits, this was a pretty disastrous vote for your party, wasn't it? Squeezed into fourth place behind the UK Independence Party. Yes, that is very disappointing. There's no point pretending otherwise. Uh, it is a blow. And it's all the more frustrating because we know on the doorstep that people are getting fed up with this Labour government. And it's what the, the frustration yes, for us is. People are fed up with the Labour government. You're supposed to be the main party of opposition. Uh, you seem to be making absolutely no inroads into that disappointment. Well, what's happening is as people move away from Labour, they're moving to all. A whole range of political parties and a whole range of particular groups. The, uh, and it's very frustrating for us that we've not done better at picking up the support from people who have become dissatisfied with Labour. And that's the challenge for us at this party conference that's coming up and beyond. Because that, I mean, this is. It's going to lead to some pretty big soul searching, though, isn't it? I mean, we could have a general election perhaps only seven months away. Uh, Labour are having a very, very difficult run at the moment and you are simply failing to capitalise on it. Yeah, the dynamics of a general election are very different. Remember, of course, that so this choosing a government... So going to be completely different when we come to the next general election campaign. I do think that if you, if you look at the evidence when people are having to choose a government and there is still a choice between a Conservative government and a Labour government, why that, we, why that, does that, change, that does change why the dynamic. The but, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that this is anything other than a very disappointing result for us. And we have to consider what it is that we do to convey more effective than we have so far, that we have policies that will make life in Britain as it is today better for the bulk of our citizens. Perhaps you need a new leader who's a bit more convincing. No, I mean, I think one of the, one of the things that our party has learned by now, Carol, is that endless speculation about the leadership no is a self-indulgent <laughs> that, self that we simply cannot afford. We are, not, we are not, yeah. we are simply, that way, the Conservative Party is not going down that way. We also keep going the to leader, do, we also yeah. keep the well, leader. Absolutely, we've, uh, Michael was elected, you know, Unanimously, as our leader, and there is no person that Conservative Party wants to get into that. No, what we have to do is focus on communicating better in a style that people understand in Britain today how what we want to do will make their lives better. It's as simple and as challenging as that. Okay, let's bring in uh, Roger Knappman in Bristol because uh, you pushed the Tories into fourth place there. Um, why do you think you managed to do that? Well, uh, I'm just looking at the percentage of vote. Uh, I'd like to know what that is. Uh, but it's very encouraging for us because it, I think it's over 10%. I mentioned earlier that the Liberals managed in the 1950s and 60s to get seats with 25 to 3% of the uh, share of vote. Now, this means we, tonight means that we approach the general election with some confidence. 
and I very much hope and believe that we can now go on to win seats next year if a general election is called. As regards the Conservatives, well, I'm afraid David Willits has asked uh, that, but they seem to have few beliefs and no conviction. Uh, by contrast, people are turning to us in increasing numbers. We beat the Liberal Democrats in the European election. We beat the Conservatives tonight. Uh, we're on our way. OK, Roger Knappman for now. Thank you very much indeed. I want to bring in, bring in Professor Anthony King. Uh, there has been a pretty big swing, a lot of movement here, but Labour, at the end of the day, they've won the seat. Absolutely. Uh, the straight swing, if we're, if we're going to talk this kind of language, from uh, Labour to the Liberal Democrats has been 19% as near as makes no difference. That's not quite as big as the round of elections we had in July, but jolly nearly as large. The Labour share of the vote uh, was at the last election uh, nearly 60%. This time round it's 40%. Uh, Labour has lost a very substantial chunk of its vote in Hartlepool. This is a rock solid, safe uh, uh, Labour area. I don't think it's entirely surprising. Uh, the Iraq war being further away, the absence of a Muslim population, which you had in the other three by-elections that we've had earlier this year, that Labour has done uh, tolerably well by the standards of recent by-elections. But as you've kept saying, and as others in the studio have said, I think the most striking single aspect of tonight's result is the driving of the Conservatives into fourth place by UKIP. Now, at a general election, many people who are prepared to vote UKIP in a Euro election or in a local election or in a by-election election will turn to another party and that will usually be the Conservatives. But I have seen some unpublished polling evidence which suggests that quite a number of UKIP supporters hold such passionate views about the European Union, are so hostile to it and so unenamored of what they see as wishy-washy Tory policy on Europe that they will be prepared at the next general election consciously to waste their vote to make the point, to make their point, that they want uh, Britain to be further removed from Europe. I think UKIP is actually a more serious problem for the Tory party, even in the context of a general election, than most people have noticed. We've always said, of course, that you can't look at a by-election result and translate it into what's going to happen at the general election. But surely this, for the Conservatives, is a pretty ominous signal for an election that might be only perhaps, what, seven months away? I'm afraid I think that's right. I mean, the most striking single thing about British politics today, as people in the studio have been saying, is we have a government that's not deeply unpopular, it's not widely hated, it's not feared, but it's not hugely respected any longer. And people would, in very large numbers, as David Willits has been saying, like to be able to vote for somebody else. And they are voting for all kinds of other people. The one party they are signally not voting for in large numbers is is the Conservative Party. That is the central fact of British politics at the moment. The Liberal Democrats, Charles Kennedy has been talking about how the Liberal Democrats could become uh, the second party in British politics. Uh, looking at what we've seen tonight and the other by-elections, do you think that is a realistic aspiration? No, I think it's almost a complete fantasy. Uh, the fact is that the Conservative Party is there, it is the alternative government, the Labour Party is there, it is the government of the day, that's the choice that people are going to make. And even people in constituencies that the Liberal Democrats can win are going to be voting Liberal Democrat or not with an eye on how well the other parties are doing and whether they feel strongly about which of the other parties wins. I think the Liberal Democrats will break through into second or even first place under only one circumstance, and that is if either of the major parties decides to fall apart. The Labour Party nearly did that in the 1980s. It gave an opening to the old Liberal STP alliance, but the Labour Party didn't completely collapse. People uh, sheared off from it, but its core remained. Uh, one of the things that worries me about the Conservative Party is that if it does very badly at the next election, there may not merely be a row over the leadership, which I suppose is possible after the general election, indeed highly probable, but that the Conservatives will be so desperate that they will begin to do drastic things like uh, beginning to stand candidates against one another, uh, having their factions which already exist within 
and the party institutionalized, only if they get themselves into deep trouble could there be circumstances in which indeed the Liberal Democrats might be able to break through. Okay, Professor Anthony King for now, thanks very much indeed. I just want to come back to uh, my panel here. Uh, Peter Hayne, do you accept this point that you are pretty unpopular and that you're only doing as well as you are doing because the protest votes are going in lots of different directions? I thought it was a pretty fair analysis by Anthony and as I was listening to him I remembered him saying things in the early 80s which is a Labour man I didn't like but it was actually true that we were all over the place we were a bit of a shower and the electorate was saw us as that and actually that's the problem facing the Conservatives what I think is interesting about the dilemma that Michael Howard now faces is he's got UKIP yapping at his heels and beating him in Hartlepool it's got to shift him more to the right even more extreme on Europe even more extreme on a whole lot of other policies and I think that's going to marginalize the Conservative Party even more which has got a big fissure opening in it with uh, the um, sensible moderate wing of the Conservatives including I might say David Willits for whom I have a lot of respect marginalized and the right wing under Michael Howard running the party and pushing it to try and grab those UKIP votes back and then losing credibility with the great mass of sensible uh, middle ground opinion in Britain which will turn to Labour. David Willits, do you think that is a real danger, that you could be marginalised? There certainly will be people in, their, in your party, won't there, who will look at what's happened tonight and said, look, if we're going to confront this threat from the UK Independence Party, we've got to have a much, much more strident anti-European line. Well, Michael Howard set out our views on Europe in an authoritative speech in Berlin earlier in the year. Doesn't seem to have resonated and, in Hartlepool, and he though, does it, it? And he's made it clear subsequently, and he laid it on the line very clearly to the parliamentary party after the European elections that he had set out our view on Europe. We wish to remain members of the European Union. We don't approve of the Constitution. We don't want to join the single currency. We want to see areas where the European Union is making a mess of things, like international development, return to national control. But we do not wish to leave the European Union. And then Michael has made it clear throughout, and however frustrating the result is tonight, it's not going to change that, that that is his view on Europe. But, but nonetheless, have, a, a result like this, yeah. not far from a general election, is going to send some shudders through your party, isn't it? It's going to be very, very difficult indeed for Michael Howard to prevent <coughs> another outbreak of people saying, well, my goodness, we've got to do something about this. We'd better find yes, another leader. I, we need to change policy. We need to change I, tack. I, I very much hope and believe that won't happen. And it will indeed be a test for the Conservative Party over the next few days as we go into their conference about how we react to that. If we reacted in that way, then that would be a serious mistake and I hope and believe that the party, after the problems we had of appearing to be arguing with ourselves over the past few years, the message for us to take from this is we have to look outwards, not inwards. That we have to look out to the British electorate and the people who are, despite all these complacent things that Peter has been saying this evening, complacent. the people who are unhappy with the performance of this Labour government have to see as they go to an election that there is a viable and feasible and credible Conservative alternative. Okay, now Simon Hughes, Charles Kennedy's been talking about your ambition to become the second party in British politics. Uh, Professor Anthony King has been saying that even on tonight's result, where once again there was a big swing to the Liberal <coughs> Democrats, it's fantasy to think that you're actually going to overtake the Conservatives. Well, Charles has always been very clear these things don't happen overnight. The party's been building since 1950. Two percent of the vote, six members of Parliament. Uh, we've got our record number of members of parliament in the 50s since 1929. We have consistently higher shares in the opinion polls. We win by-elections in seats we never used to win. I too don't believe in a big bang theory. It's a gradual process. But Charles wants what I want, what we want, which is to overtake the Tories as soon as is practically possible so that we'll end up with a century. Yes, it may be more varied, there may be other parties, but there'll be a century when there'll be a social democratic Labour government, it's not a Labour government anymore, a socialist government, but it's a social democratic sort of government, and a Liberal Democrat alternative. And I think that's possible. Now, how soon it happens is up to the great British electorate. The interesting thing from tonight is firstly that the Tories are confirming they are in trouble, and secondly that with Tony Blair's announcement that he's going to seek a third term and serve it through, that the real issue is of can you trust the government will not go away, because we're going to have a Blair government if we have a Labour government, and people have considerably lost trust in Tony Blair. Okay, let's bring in uh, Roger Natman from UKIP, who's there in Bristol. You succeeded in uh, getting third place tonight. Are you going to have to broaden your appeal a bit more as we approach the general election, not just talk about Europe? 
Uh, well, actually, we, we do talk about a lot of other subjects except Europe. It's just that we don't actually get to ask questions other than about Europe. And it is very difficult for a relatively new party without a single newspaper, without a single magazine, with a fraction of the publicity that the other three parties get. It's very difficult for us to get uh, our broad range of, uh, of points across. But we're gaining. We're gaining in strength. We gained hugely uh, and came third in the European elections. We come third tonight. That's a, a huge step forward. And I think that people will now start to take us more seriously. Because the more I look at this result, the better pleased I am with it. It's one of the few seats we did not fight uh, in the general election. Uh, we're accused of taking votes principally from the Conservatives, yet this is a very much a Labour town. So it was very difficult territory for us, and still we've got nearly 11% of the vote. Now that's very, very good. Simon Hughes uh, okay. mentioned that he got 2.5%, actually said 2%, but it was 2.5% in the 1950s and got six uh, uh, seats. We're getting a 10.8% tonight. How many seats for us in the general election? We're on our way. Okay, Roger Knappman in Bristol, thank you very much thank indeed you. for talking to us uh, down the line there from Bristol. My thanks also to David Willits from the Conservatives, Simon Hughes from the Liberal Democrats and to Peter Hain from the Labour Party. Thank you very much indeed for joining us because we're going to move on now and talk about our other main story tonight, which is that it's been revealed that the Prime Minister is to go into hospital later today to undergo treatment to correct a problem. At the moment we're going to be talking to Julia Hartley Brewer, the political editor of the Sunday Express and some more to Professor Anthony King. But let's go to Hartlepool now. And we're joined by the winning candidate, the new Labour MP for Hartlepool, Ian Wright. Uh, Ian, first of all, uh, congratulations. Uh, why do you think that you, you managed much. to hold on there? It was obviously always going to be a pretty tight race with the Liberal Democrats. I think we were offering credible solutions to the people of Hartlepool in terms of crime, antisocial behaviour. People like what I was saying about being tough on yobs, thugs, um, and making sure that the streets are safe from drug dealers. It does seem as though the whole campaign focused very much on local issues and some of the things which have caused uh, big difficulties for Labour in other by-elections, of course the Iraq war and so on, didn't play such a factor there. I spoke to about 10,000 people during the course of the election and the main concerns were crime, fear of crime and antisocial behaviour. I was responding to the electorate's concerns. So I agree with you. National issues that may have played a part in other by-elections um, weren't considered as important to the people of Hartlepool as local issues when they, what they see when they go out of their doorsteps um, on a morning. What do you think about this whole issue of trust? Tony Blair himself has admitted it's quite a problem for the Labour government, uh, particularly, of course, because of the decision to go to war in Iraq, uh, that there is a real lack of trust in him as leader. I'm just delighted. I think that the victory tonight is, is great news for Tony Blair and for the Labour government. You know, after seven years of a Labour government, the fact that we're winning by-elections um, still and that the Tories are coming forth says an awful lot about what a great shape um, the Labour government is actually in. Do you think that there was a, a real possibility here that the Liberal Democrats were going to defeat you? They've certainly eaten into your majority. I mean Peter Mandelson had a 14,000 majority. Yours is only just around 2,000. There has been a big swing away from you to the Liberal Democrats. That's something that you're going to have to confront come the general election. Yes, and I'm, I'm really up for that, but I think that a by-election that was caused by the voluntary resignation of a sitting Labour MP, seven years into a Labour government, the fact that we can command a majority of over 2,000 is absolutely great news. I'm absolutely delighted. And what is going to be your priority now? Of course, you're going to be uh, down here at Westminster. Will you, will you still be focusing on those local issues? I'm going to be the strongest possible constituency MP f focusing on local issues. What I want to do, I pledge to the people of Hartlepool that the first thing I would do if elected as their MP was seek a meeting on Friday morning with the police to make sure that their concerns about fear of crime and antisocial behaviour are being addressed. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be knocking on the door of Cleveland Police tomorrow morning to address those concerns. 
Okay, Ian Wright, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us and uh, congratulations to you there in, thank Hart you. in Hartlepool. We're joined now back here in the studio by Julia Hartley Brewer, who's the political editor of the Sunday Express. Uh, this by election, first of all, what do you make of that result? Labour obviously delighted to have hung yeah. on. Well, I think um, parties are very, very good at always claiming a victory no matter where they come. I mean, Labour can certainly claim a victory. Lib Dems did very well. They completely slashed uh, the, the uh, Labour majority there. And of course, tremendous results of the UK Independence Party. The only party, of course, who can't claim they did at all well were the Tories. I mean, this is absolutely devastating for Michael Hadd. There is no party in the opposition that has gone on to win a general election after doing so badly in general elections, going from parties where, in, in seats where they're at second place and going to third or fourth place. I mean, this is just, there is no precedent from doing this. And when they talk about, you know, oh, well, you know, it's not really a Tory Heartland seat. It's a, it, this is Labour. This is a Labour territory. This is exactly the sort of place where they've got to be coming at the very you know, least a close second to be having a chance at the next general election. And you've got to remember, 97, 2001, we're talking about electoral annihilation for the Tories in terms of the number of general election um, seats they were able to win. And so, you know, you're starting from a very low base. They're, the only way up, the only way is up. And if they're not actually doing, scoring well at a time when Tony Blair is under so much pressure in Iraq and under so much pressure on the issues of trust and on issues of tax, there are so many different things, asylum, immigration, crime, Issue after issue where the government is doing really badly and the Tories are totally failing to capitalise on it. I mean, Michael we, Howard will be a very unhappy man tomorrow. And, of course, uh, the Tories have got their own party conference starting uh, mm. at the weekend. Yep. Is there a real danger here that people are going to start to panic within the Conservative Party? They're saying Michael Howard's just not doing it for us. People don't believe in him. Mm. And we have uh, another round of infighting. Well, I mean, uh, Michael Howard has done a pretty good job uh, since he's uh, been leader. Less than a year, of course, since he's been leader in actually keeping all that uh, sort of under wraps. But, I mean, th that's this is the thing. He hasn't actually improved the poll ratings since Ian Duncan Smith was in, in power, in, in the leadership. And, of course, people thought that he was sort of, a totally sort of failed leader. And yet Michael Howard, regarded, I think, by a lot of people as much, a much stronger leader than, than um, Ian Duncan Smith, much more in control of the party, more forceful, perhaps connecting better with voters, and yet that he has not reaped anything in the polls in terms of a reward for all the policy ideas, the promises, the pledges that we're expecting to hear over the next week. I mean, it's a very difficult start to, uh, to a, a Tory um, conference week, I think. Your paper, of course, has thrown its support yep. behind Michael Howard. Yep. Why is it going so disastrously wrong well, for him? Do you know, I mean, I've, I had an interview with, uh, with Michael Howard today, ready for my paper on Sunday, and, and, I, and I asked exactly this. And his view is, you know, that they, they actually, they, you know, the Tories won um, in, the, uh, gen in, in the European elections and the local elections, and actually they're still very, very hopeful. But he would say that, of course, wouldn't he, um, for, uh, for the general election. But the polls, I mean, as, as you can you know, vouch for, Tony King, of course, that, you know, the, the figures don't lie, the statistics don't lie, and actually, you know, it, it, it's virtually impossible, really, that the Tories can win the next election yes. on this basis. Professor Tony King, let's um, bring you in here. Um, this really does put a, a death nail, really, on any hopes that the Tories might have still been clinging on to that they could actually overturn the Labour government. I think that's absolutely right. We ought to extend the time span. Uh, people are now focusing on Michael Howard, but there was somebody before him, Ian Duncan Smith, and there was somebody before him <laughs> called William Hague. There was somebody before him called John Major. The Conservatives have been, to use the cliché of our time, flatlining effectively for a decade. Now, if that's the case, it becomes a little uh, odd to say, oh, it's the leader's fault. I mean, if you keep changing the leader, and these are very different people. William Haig and Ian Duncan Smith had almost nothing in common. Neither has much in common with uh, Michael Howard, except being members of the Conservative Party. Uh, they've all tried in their different ways to revive the Tory party's fortunes. They've all failed. The inference I draw from that is that you don't look to the leader in any simple kind kind of way, you say, what is it about the Conservative Party that has caused one of the great uh, political parties uh, of the last two and a half centuries, what has caused that party to become so disconnected from so many voters? That's the issue they well, really have to well, address. The, the, the Tories had been hoping at least to be making gains at the next general election. Do you think that they could actually do even worse than they did last time? How serious is this trough that they're in? 
Well, Julia said something a moment ago which I disagreed with. I almost never disagreed with her. But she said, <laughs> she, she said uh, the only way to go is up. This is simply not true. There is another way to I'm go, an and that's, uh, <laughs> that's down. And one has to allow for the possibility that if the Conservatives are still seen at the time of the election, which, as you say, may not be very far off, as being so out of it, so alien, so uh, not a party we really want to vote for, then I think it at least possible, not probably that Labour would pick up many seats from uh, the Tories, but I think the Liberal Democrats might. Yeah, well, what was interesting actually what's happened in Hartlepool, if you look at the election literature, it always gives you a good idea of like, where the party leaders are in the standing. You know, Tony Blair, I think his picture was postage stamp, stamp size in one leaflet, the entire um, Labour campaign, he was not, and although his, his constituency is only next door, he, he didn't actually turn up at all to the campaign. Uh, Michael Howard made one visit, Charles Kennedy six. Charles Kennedy's face was all over the election literature. I mean, there's no question at all within the, the view of the campaign machines of the parties that Charles Kennedy is a vote winner. Michael Howard isn't, and certainly Tony Blair isn't. And I think that actually tells you a lot about how the next general election campaigns are going to be fought. Um, um, just very briefly, what about uh, the showing from UKIP now? Now, surely that is going to strengthen the hand of people in the Conservative Party who say, this is going to cost us votes, we've yes. simply got to have a much more strident anti-European yeah. policy. Well, this is the irony, of course, isn't it, that a vote for UKIP actually damages the Tories more than it would damage Labour. Of course, lots of people vote UKIP as a sort of a protest vote against the government. Yeah, I mean, this is a massive pressure on, on Michael Howard to sort of move his party to a, more, a much more Eurosceptic line, whereas actually he's been quite successful, I think, in sort of uniting the party around a sort of fairly Eurosceptic, but not, not sort of rapidly anti-Europe line. And, uh, and I think there's quite a strong view in the party that he's going to have to go further right. But, of course, then he'll lose all the, the very voters, of course, that he's trying to reap uh, in, in the centre ground, which is where basically all British elections are fought. They're not fought at the extremes. The BNP may pick up a vote here or there, or UKIP. Actually, they're fought in the centre ground that the Labour Party took so strongly in 97 and 2001, and those are the voters he needs. OK. Julia Hartley-Brewer, uh, Professor Anthony King, thank you for now.